Hi guys, let's start with part 2 of chapter 4 that is the making of a global world. 2.3 Late 19th century colonialism Trade flourished and markets expanded in the late 19th century. But this was not only a period of expanding trade and increased prosperity. It is important to realize that there was a darker side of this process. In many parts of the world, the expansion of trade and a closer relationship with the world economy also meant a loss of freedom. Also meant a loss of freedoms and livelihoods. Late 19th century European Late 19th century European conquest produced many painful economic, social and ecological changes through which the colonized societies were brought into the world economy. Look at a map of Africa, figure 10. You will see some countries' borders run straight, as if they were drawn using a ruler. Well, in fact, this was almost how rival European powers in Africa drew up the borders, demarcating their respective territories. In 1885, so in 1885, the big European powers met in Berlin to complete the carving up, to complete the carving up of Africa between them. Britain and France made vast additions. So Britain and France made vast additions to their overseas territories in the late 19th century. Belgium and Germany became new colonial powers. So Belgium and Germany became new colonial powers. The U.S. also came, uh, the, so the U.S. also became a colonial power in the late 19, in the late 1890s by taking over some colonies earlier held by Spain. So new pol colonial powers came up like Belgium, like Germany and the US also it became a colonial power in the late 1890s and it took over some colonies earlier held by Spain. Let us look at one example of the destructive impact of colonialism on the economy and livelihoods of colonized people. Here's a figure we have, figure 10. So, he, this is the continent of Africa. And in here, we have, these are the colonies which are under Belgian, then F British, then French, German, Italian, Portuguese, Spanish, British Dominion, Independent State. Okay, so figure 10, map of colonial Africa and at the end of the 19th century. Uh, we have box 2. Sir Henry Morton Stanley in Central Africa. So Sir Henry Morton Stanley in Central Africa. Stanley was a journalist and explorer sent by the New York Herald to find Livingston, a missionary and explorer who had been in Africa for several years years. Like other European and American explorers of the time, Stanley went with arms, mobilized local hunters, warriors and laborers to help him, fought with local tribes, investigated African terrains and mapped different reasons. These explorations helped the conquest of Africa. Geographical explorations were not driven by an innocent search for scientific information. They were directly linked to imperial projects. Here we have a figure. So figure 11, Sir Henry Morton Stanley and his retinue in Central Africa, Illustrated London News, 1871. Then 
2.4 Rinder Pest or the Cattle Plague. In Africa in the 1890s, a fast spreading disease of cattle plague or Rinder Pest had a terrifying impact on people's livelihoods and the local economy. So in Africa in the 1890s, a fast spreading disease of cattle plague or rinder pest had a terrifying impact on people's livelihoods and the local economy. This is a good example of the widespread European imperial impact on colonized societies. It shows how in this era of conquest, even a disease affecting cat cattle reshaped the lives and fortunes of thousands of people and their relations with the rest of the world. Here we have a figure. So this is a figure. Figure 2. Transport of the Transvaal Gold Mines. The Graphic 1887. Crossing the Welch River was the quickest method of transport to the gold fields of Transvaal. After the discovery of gold in Witwatersrand, Rand, uh, Europeans rushed to the reason despite their fear of disease and death and the difficulties of the journey. By the 1890s, South Africa contributed over 20% of the world gold production. Historically, Africa had abundant land. So, historically, Africa had abundant land and a relatively small population. For centuries, land and livestock sustained African livelihood and people rarely worked for a wage. In late 19th century, Africa there Okay, in late 19th century Africa, there were few consumer goods. So they had few consumer goods that wages could buy. If you had been an African possessing land and livestock and there was plenty of both, you too would have seen little reason to work for a wage. In the late 19th century, Europeans were attracted to Africa. So, in the late 19th century, Europeans were attracted to Africa due to its vast resources. Due to its vast resources of land and minerals. Europeans came to Africa hoping to establish plantations and mines to produce crops and minerals for export to Europe. But there was an expected problem, a shortage of labor willing to work for wages. Employers used many methods to recruit and retain labor, so employers they used many methods to recruit and retain labor. Heavy taxes were imposed, which could be paid only by working for wages on plantations and mines. Inheritance laws were changed so that so that peasants were displaced from land. Only one member so only one member of a family was allowed to inherit land as a result of which the others were pushed into the labor market. Mine workers were also confined in compounds and not allowed to move about freely. Here we have a figure. Here this is a figure. Figure 13. Diggers at work in the Transvaal gold fields in South Africa. The graphic 1875. So then came Rinderpest. Okay, so the cattle plague. 
a devastating cattle disease. Rinder pest arrived in Africa in the late 1880s. It was carried by infected cattle imported from British Asia to feed the Italian soldiers invading Eritrea in East Africa. Entering Africa in the east, Rinderpest moved to west like wild, like forest fire, reaching Africa's Atlantic coast in 1892. It reached the Cape, Africa's southernmost tip, five years later. Along the way, Rinderpest killed 90% of the cattle. The loss of cattle destroyed African livelihood. So the loss of cattle destroyed African livelihood. Planters, mine owners and colonial governments now successfully monopolized what scarce cattle resources remained to strengthen their power and to force Africans into the labor market. Control over the scarce resource of cattle enabled European colonizers to conquer and subdue Africa. Similar stories can be told about the impact of Western conquest on other parts of the 19th century world. 2.4. Endangered labor migration from India. So, endangered labor. A bonded laborer under contract to work for an employer for a specific amount of time to pay off his passage to a new country or home. So, 2.4. Endangered labor migration from India. The example of endangered labor migration from India also illustrates the two-sided nature of the 19th century world. It was a world of fast economic growth as well as great misery, higher incomes for some and poverty for others. Technological advances in some areas and new forms of coercion in others. In the 19th century, hundreds of thousands of Indians and Chinese laborers went to work on plantations, in mines, and in road and railway construction projects around the world. In India, endangered laborers were hired under contracts which promised return travel to India after they had worked five years on their employer's plantation. So it was promised to them that they would be returned to India after they had worked five years on their employer's plantation. Most Indian endangered workers came from the present day regions of eastern Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, central India, and the dry districts of Tamil Nadu. In the mid 19th century, these regions experienced many changes. Cottage industries declined, land rents rose, lands were cleared for mines and plantations. All these affected the lives of the poor. They failed to pay their rents, became deeply indebted, and were forced to migrate in search of work. The main destination of Indian endangered migrants were the Caribbean islands, mainly Trinidad and Guyana and Suriname, Mauritius and Fiji. Closer home, Tamil migrants went to Ceylon and Malaya. Endangered workers were also recruited for tea plantations in Assam. Recruitment was done by agents engaged by employers and paid a small commission. Many migrants agreed to take up work hoping to escape poverty or oppression in their home villages. Agents also tempted the prospective migrants by providing false information about final destinations, modes of travel and the nature of work and living and working conditions. Often migrants 
were not even told that they were to embark on a long sea voyage. Sometimes agents even forcibly abducted less willing migrants. So they were abducted also sometimes and sometimes they were given false information also. Figure 14. Indian endangered laborers in a cocoa plantation in Trinidad, early 19th century. 19th century endangered. So the 19th century endangered has been described as a new system of slavery. So, it is a new system of slavery. On the arrival at the plantations, laborers found conditions to be different from what they had imagined. Living and working conditions were harsh and there were few legal rights. But workers discovered their own ways of surviving. Many of them escaped into the wilds, though if caught, they faced severe punishment. Others developed new forms of individual and collective self-expression, blending different cultural forms, old and new. In Trinidad, the annual Muharram procession, so in Trinidad, the annual Muharram procession was transformed into a riotous carnival called Jose for Imam Hussein, in which workers of all races and religions joined. Similarly, the protest re religion of Rastafarianism. Okay, so similarly, the protest religion of Rastafarianism made famous by the Jamaican reggae star Bob Marley is also said to reflect social and cultural links with Indian migrants to the Caribbean. So similarly the protest religion of Rastafarianism made famous by the Jamaican reggae star Bob Marley is also said to reflect social and cultural links with Indian migrants to the Caribbean. Chutney music. Chutney music popular in Trinidad and Guyana is another creative contemporary expression of the post in danger experience. These forms of cultural fusion are part of the making of the global world, where things from different places get mixed, lost their original characteristics and become something entirely new. Most endangered workers stayed on different. Okay, so most endangered workers stayed on after their contracts ended or returned to their new homes after a short spell in India. Consequently, there are large communities of people in Indian descent. Okay, so there are large communities of people of Indian descent in these countries. Here we have a figure. Figure. Figure 15. Endangered laborers photographed for identification. For the employers, the numbers and not the names mattered. So... Have you heard of the Nobel Prize winning writer V.S. Naipaul? Some of you may have followed the exploits of West Indies cricketers Shiv Narin, Chandar Pal and Ram Naresh Sarvan. If you have wondered why their names sound vaguely Indian, the answer is that they are descendant from endangered labor migrants from India. So, those descendants of Indian migrants, so we can see them and some of them are V.S. Naipal and Shiv Narin, Chandarpal and Ram Naresh Sarvan. Then we have another figure, figure 16. 
a contract form of an endangered laborer. From the 1900s, India's nationalist leaders began opposing the system of endangered labor migration as abusive and cruel. It was abolished. So, it was abolished in 1921. Yet, for a number of decades afterwards, descendants of Indian endangered workers often thought of as coolies remained and uneasy minority in the Caribbean islands. Some of Naipaul's early novels capture their sense of loss and alienation. 2.5 Indian Entrepreneurs Abroad 2.5 Indian Entrepreneurs Abroad Growing food and other crops for the world market required capital. Large pl plantations could borrow it from banks and markets. So, large plantations could borrow it from banks and markets. But what about the humble peasants? Enter the Indian banker. Do you know of the Shikari Puri Shroff and Natu Kotai Chetiars? Do you know of the Shikari Puri Shroffs and Natu Kotai Chetiars? They were amongst the many groups of bankers and traders who financed export agriculture in Central and Southeast Asia using either their own funds or those borrowed from European banks. They had a sophisticated system to transfer money over large distances and even developed indigenous forms of corporate organization. Indian traders and money lenders also followed European colonizers into Africa. So, Indian traders and money lenders also followed European colonizers into Africa. Hyderabadi Sindhi traders, however, ventured beyond European colonies. From the 1860s, they established flourishing emporia at busy ports worldwide, selling local and imported curios to tourists whose numbers were beginning to swell thanks to the development of safe and comfortable passenger vessels. Here we have a source, source A, the testimony of an endangered laborer. Extract from the testimony of Ram Narain Tiwari, an endangered laborer who spent 10 years on Demerara in the early 20th century. In spite of my best efforts, I could not properly do the works that were allotted to me. In a few days, I got my hands bruised all over and I could not go to work for a week for which I was prosecuted and sent to jail for 14 days. New immigrants find the task allotted to them extremely heavy and cannot complete them in a day. Deductions are also made from wages if the work is considered to have been done unsatisfactorily. Many people cannot therefore earn their full wages and are punished in various ways. In fact, the laborers have to spend their period of endanger in great trouble. 2.6 Indian Trade, Colonialism and the Global System Historically, fine cottons produced in India were exported to Europe. So, historically, fine cottons produced in India were exported to Europe. With industrialization, British cotton manufacture began to expand and industrialists pressurized the government to restrict cotton imports and protect local industries. Tariffs were imposed on cotton imports into Britain. Consequently, the inflow of fine Indian cotton 
begin to decline. From the early 19th century, British manufacturers also begin to seek overseas markets for their cloth. So begin so they begin to seek overseas markets for their cloth. Excluded from the British so excluded from the British markets by tariff barriers, Indian textiles now faced stiff competition in other international markets. If we look at the figures of exports from India, we see a steady decline of the share of cotton textiles from some 30% around 1800 to 15% by 1815. By the 1870s, this proportion had dropped to below 3%. So here is a figure. Figure 17, East India Company House, London. This was the nerve center of the worldwide operations of the East India Company. What then did India export? The figures again tell a dramatic story. While exports of manufactures declined rapidly, export of raw materials increased equally fast. Between 1812 and 1871, the share of raw cotton exports rose from 5% to 35%. Indigo used for dyeing cloth was another important export for many decades. And as you have read last year, opium shipments to China grew rapidly from the 1820s to become for a while India's single largest export. Britain grew opium in India and exported it to China and with the money earned through sale it financed its tea and other imports from China. Here we have a figure. So figure 18 a distant view of Surat and its river all through the 17th and early 18th centuries surat remained the main center of overseas trade in the western indian ocean over the 19th century british manufacturers flooded the indian market so over the 19th century, industrialization began in Britain and so because of it, the British manufacturers flooded the Indian market. Food, grain and raw material exports from India to Britain and the rest of the world increased. But the value of British exports to India was much higher than the value of British imports from India. Thus, Britain had a trade surplus with India. Britain used this surplus to balance its trade deficits with other countries, that is with countries from which Britain was importing more than it was selling to. This is how a multilateral settlement system works. It allows one country's deficit with another country to be settled by its surplus with the third country. By helping Britain balance its deficit, India played a crucial role in the late 19th century world economy. Britain's trade surplus in India also helped pay the so-called home charges that included private remittances home by British officials and traders, interest payments on India's external debt and pensions of British officials in India. So Britain's trade surplus in India also helped pay the so-called home charges that included private remittances home by British officials and traders, interest payments on India's external debt and pensions of British officials in India. Here we have a map. So this blue line, this is the sea route and the dotted line, these are the land route. 
then we have volume of trade passing through the port okay surat has a huge volume hugli masuli patam madras goa then we have malacca then bangkok hanoi canton hugli okay three the inter water economy so the inter what okay inter war economy three the inter war economy the first world war from 1914 to 18 was mainly fought in europe but its impact was felt around the world notably for our concerns in this chapter it plunged the first half of the 20th century into a crisis that took over three decades to overcome during this period the world experienced widespread economic and political instability and another catastrophic war 3.1 war time transformations the first world war as you know was fought between two power blocks one so on the one side were the allies britain france and russia later joined by the us and on the opposite side were the central powers like germany austria hungary and ottoman turkey when the war began in august 1914 many governments thought it would be over by christmas it lasted more than 4 years The First World War was a war like no other before. The fighting involved the world's leading industrial nations, which now harnessed their vast powers of modern industry to inflict the greatest possible destruction on their enemies. This war was thus the first modern industrial war. It saw the use of machine guns, tanks, aircrafts, chemical weapons, etc. on a massive scale. These were all increasingly produced. Okay. These were all increasingly products of modern large-scale industry. To fight the war, millions of soldiers had to be recruited from around the world and moved to the front lines on large ships and trains. The scale of death and destruction, 9 million dead and 20 million injured, was unthinkable before the industrial age without the use of industrial arms. Most of the killed and maimed were men of working age. Okay, so most of the So most of the killed and maimed were men of working age. These deaths and injuries reduced the able-bodied workforce in Europe. With fewer numbers within the family, household incomes declined after the war. During the war, industries were structured to produce war-related goods. Entire societies were also reorganized for war. As men went to battle, women stepped in to undertake jobs that earlier only men were expected to do. figure 20 so workers in a munition factory during the first world war production of armaments increased rapidly to meet war demands so to meet the war demands the production also increased for armaments The war led to the snapping of economic links between some of the world's largest economic powers which were now fighting each other to pay for them. So Britain borrowed large sum of money from US banks as well as the US public. 
dusty war transformed the U.S. from being an international debtor to an international creditor. In other words, as the war ended, the U.S. and its citizens owned more overseas assets than foreign governments and citizens owned in the U.S. So that's all guys. See you in my next video. Bye.